We'll talk a little bit about him. But we also want to say that Sarah and I have just come off of two out of three full days of training, which is why we're not really dressed for Friday evening. So we apologize that we're a little schlumpy tonight. I don't know. I kind of wear this on Friday evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, so this is what this is. Okay, apart from having shoes on, you might find me in this at home. So that's true. Okay. So um, we are so excited, and thank you so much for coming out on a Friday evening in beautiful weather. Um, this is a really exciting evening, and the work we've been doing with Glenn, which we'll talk a little bit more about, is pretty exciting. But we want to tell you a little bit about who Glenn is. He's the director of the Center for Te uh, Transformative Teaching and Learning at St. Andrews. I, how many of you looked at the website when we sent out the link or kind of checked out that paragraph? Okay, good, so I won't repeat all that. Um, but Sarah and I have known Glenn for many years separately, and then when we all came together here, now we've got this nice uh, commonality, so there's a nice little linkage. Um, and Glenn has been a real supporter of our work in the Peter Clark Center. By the way, I don't know if I introduce myself. I'm Daisy Pellant, the director of the Peter Clark Center. And I'm Sarah Float, and I help out coordinating there, but then I teach middle school history. history Sarah's as well. the coordinator of the Peter Clark Center. So together we are putting it all together. And Glenn has been instrumental in being incredibly supportive of us because his center out at St. Andrews School in Potomac, Maryland, is about 10 years ahead of us. And interestingly, and Glenn, you can probably say more about this, Breck and St. Andrews, and maybe not even on one hand, there are just very few centers like this. So this is really exciting that we can come together. And Glenn's been working with our faculty fellows, 18 faculty members, pre-K 12, and across all different disciplines in what he's gonna to talk to you tonight about the neurodevelopmental framework and teaching for all kinds of minds and mind brain and education approach to the way we teach every day in the classroom. Sarah, what do you wanna to add to that? I would just say that um, when I was a young teacher, some of this work was just starting and um, Peter Clark, who was here at the time, um, led the middle school faculty through a very similar training, giving us the language, a common language um, with which to talk about education and our students. And it was transformative for me as a young teacher, and that was, you know, 25 years ago. So and how many people went through that training are currently at Brown? In the middle school, there are probably four of us that are still okay. here. So you can imagine that it was just middle school. So it's time <coughs> to look at the latest iteration and the most current research informed understanding of our practice. So that's why we're all here tonight. We need you as parents to be part of this. So you will hopefully help be the ambassadors as we move forward and even develop a parent version of this training. Because that's in the works. It'll be an, at least a year out, but be patient and be ready to, to be ambassadors for us at that time. And we have a bunch of cash. <coughs> what are we supposed to do with it, Glenn? Uh, everybody gets a dollar bill. Awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm going to make it rain. I never <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cap one down to each person. You get the other eye out, There's three for you to rub. And the rest of you are here. And the rest of you are here. And the rest of you are here. Do you want to buy it? I might as well play. All right, who wants money over here? All right, there you go. Actually, you need to do the end of the row down there. Too. I'm running out of cash. That's the story of my life. Wait, one Anyone else? Here we go. Slow. Do you get one? Okay, don't be shy. You don't have a dollar. Brad's got two. You got extras. Anyone not have their dollar bill? I don't like sugar pops. You guys get your dollars. Thank you. Everybody's got their dollars, so Sarah, you're not keeping the rest. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Take it away, Mr. Awesome. Take it away. All right. So, uh, who's, any Springsteen fans in the audience? Awesome. My bottom, please keep playing. Don't forget the rest of the presentation. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'm a history teacher. I still teach history. I'm an 11th grade history teacher. I begin every one of my classes with the opening refrain to the greatest song ever written by the greatest musician in America. Uh, bias, I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> 
Uh, why do I do that? So there's a lot, there's no rhetorical questions today, tonight. Uh, this is active participation. So uh, why do I begin 11th grade history class, the opening refrain to Bruce Springsteen's um, Born to Run? To motivate them? Motivate? Get you engaged. Engage them? Connect them? Connection. Connection? Yeah. Absolutely. It's also novel. It reminds them, you know, hey, it's time to start history. Uh, it's also fun. It's playful. And we know music actually gives our brains dopamine boosts. Um, and hopefully, I teach the period just before lunch to high school, senior, uh, high school juniors right now. They just had four periods. So I have to do something to make sure I can get them working at their maximum potential and full potential. So no, I, all they really care about is eating, to be honest with you. So uh, I, I use Frank Sing. I, I use one other song differently. Uh, actually, next on Monday, I'll use Billy, Billy Joel, so I'll save that male New York theme uh, for a variety of reasons when we start the Cold War. But uh, I really appreciate being here. When uh, uh, I'm amazed, actually, about two things about Breck. Um, Daisy and Sarah have set up Breck excellent to me, and I flew out here. Um, the idea, when she said that we were going to have people actually show up on a Friday night to listen to me speak, uh, I thought was absolutely nuts. So hats off to you. What I think is even a little more nuts is that tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, there's going to be 20 hours <coughs> back for the third day on a Saturday where I heard it's going to be about 70 degrees in Minnesota. Um, I, I'm still not too sure if they're all going to show up, but they've been one of the most dedicated, awesome groups uh, we have worked with. So thank you for coming out. This is going to be very playful, interactive. We're actually going to be standing up and moving around. Uh, let me just make sure this thing works. Here's my question for you. What two things do you wish for your son and daughter every day they head off to Brett? If you could only wish for two things every day, whether the lower school, middle school, or the upper school, what two things do you wish for them? Him or her? Yes. That they learn and they have fun. Okay, learn, have fun. Others? Positive affirmations. Positive affirmations. Friendship. Yeah. That they're energized and they feel connected to their teachers. Excellent. Connection, energy. Yep. Yeah. Others? That they advocate for themselves. They learn to self advocate, which is one of the most important skills that they, that they can develop. Absolutely. One more? They have a safe space. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, we have both. Safe space, you said? Yeah. Safe? Great. And? And excited to learn. Excited about learning. Right. Excited to learn. Absolutely. So when I've asked that question before, and I ask it a lot to big groups, <coughs> I, I get, I usually get, and if you, all your things fill in to the same genre, I want my child to be happy, right? And happy can mean a lot of different things. And I want them to be challenged, right? And here's a good thing about it. Uh, those aren't mutually, mutually exclusive. Happy students, safe feeling students, learn more. <coughs> research suggests that. Not only that research actually validates that. And here's the thing, if we can get teachers to think like that, to think about how, how to create happy, safe, warm, relationally strong environments, while also challenging our students every day, pushing him or her a little further, learning to read, learning to spell, learning their times tables, learning calculus, right? That is the kind of school I know, I, I pay for, I pay for independent school back east, um, and I'm hopefully it's here at Brett. Um, so keep that in mind, so we're gonna get back to that. Uh, and as most of you hopefully know, it's funny walking around the school, I'm seeing my face plastered over everywhere. <laughs> uh, hopefully I look better in person than, than, than in the photos. Uh, I co-authored a book, Nora Peach, I see somebody has it, awesome, I appreciate it. Helping to pay for my daughter and son's college, not really, but. Uh, I teach, I've been in independent school education for 25 years. I went to Dickinson College as an undergrad in Pennsylvania, if anybody's from that part of the world. And then I did a master's at Dartmouth before uh, uh, working in three different schools. I advise, I coach varsity girls soccer, um, and I direct our center. Um, so we have the same job as, as Daisy. Um, I was also an athlete. Uh, growing up, a big athlete. I, I love sports. Sports was transformative for me, mostly because my mother. My father would call the equipment manager, my mom would call the athlete. Uh, but he bowled. He was a big tech bowler, which I always joke to him about. Uh, and 
my greatest non-competitive athletic moment was this event. Uh, anybody know this event? Yeah, what was this event? Yeah. 1980, Miracle on Ice. Yeah, Miracle on Ice. Um, anybody know who scored this goal? This is the this is the fourth goal in the four three victory over the Russians. The captain of the U.S. Ruzioni. Thank you, Ruzioni. Thank you, sir. Well done. Absolutely. And I often, you know, I, I was coming to a hockey school, one a hockey school, so I had to play with this one. Um, but I often think, you know, what should be our goals for today or tonight? And my question is, why do you come to them? What got you here? What do you want to know? What's intriguing you as parents? Because ultimately, you're not only your son or daughter's first teacher, which you, depending on the age, they come home to you. Okay? And you're dealing with homework. You're dealing with stress. You're dealing with the college process. And I would argue I'd love for you to leave here tonight with some strategies other than telling them to do your homework. Get off your cell phone. Yeah. And we're going to play with that. But what, why? Why do you come tonight? Yeah. I like the idea that you um, put forward about learning differences and helping all students by teaching to all of them in different ways in the same room. So I have a son who has some learning differences and um, has spent you know, a lot of time over the last several years figuring out what's best for him. And his big thing is to be a part of everything else. So I like the um, drive of the school to to create a learning environment that everyone can succeed in. And, and I'll just say this. There's one thing I know deeply as a teacher. Every student learns differently. There's no question about it. I'm going to prove tonight that everyone in this room learns differently. Right? So I don't want us to be afraid of the word learning differences. Right? That's who we are. We're humans. Right? The brain is the most complex organ in, in, in the body. If we all learned the same and thought the same, that would be boring. So how do we honor that? How do we honor that kid who's, who's knocking out the park, park in the classroom on an essay or learning things early in life, in life, learning Spanish at a young age, or who might be struggling at a given time? So thank you. Others, why are you here? I'm glad you're here. I'm not trying to kick you out. I want to be clear on that. But why are you here? Yes? My undergraduate degree was in child development in 1977. Where from? Tufts. Okay. And it is astounding how much things have changed. It is. And I now have three 15-year-olds with learning differences. 16, excuse me. It turned 16 <laughs> last week. We won't, we won't tell you. And um, they're very, very different. And there are times that I just don't, I, sh I feel like I should be able to help them with my background, but uh, the one who's particularly ADD and, D and dyslexic is really struggling. Okay. Well, thanks for your honesty, one. And yes, let's, let's, let's figure it out. What other? What got you through this door? Yeah. Um, I'm a new parent to Brad, okay. the son who's just here for the first year, and okay. I feel so fortunate that Brock is one of the schools that's really diving into this approach, and I'm excited to know more about, you know, how it's all going to come together and how to reinforce that as a parent at home. Okay. And as Daisy said, she's exactly right. There, are, a lot of schools have teaching and learning centers. We were talking about this as we were driving. But the intentionality around mind, brain, education, science, and the learning brain is very unique. But we'll position Breck as a regional leader, as a national leader, very quickly because every independent school is, is getting on this train, uh, which is exciting. Very exciting for you. Great. Um, here's one of my hopes. I hope you understand by the time that we're together what the meaning of these three numbers are. So I actually want you to start thinking, how are you going to remember these three numbers? Now you can write them down. That's easy. Right. Or you can create a, uh, a lot of people think of the number 131. That's their strategy for memorizing it. But you, I want you to be very cognizant as I talk, and you guys work tonight, of how these numbers pop up. But we have to have a challenge first. Because we know you learn better when you're challenged. We know you learn better when you're stretched. So. Most Breck events, I'm assuming if it's anything like my school, you show up and you're asked for money. Right? There's a lot of events, right, that they're donor events or supporter events, which we need, our schools need. Here's an opportunity to leave with an extra with a dollar. 
All right? Why not? All right? So here's the challenge. This is it. Uh, can you attend to this session without checking your email, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, toggling between unrelated websites or online shopping on your laptop, iPad, or phone, even once? If you can do that, and I grant, I know your parents, so, and you might need to answer that phone, you might have a babysitter, or something might, that's fine. Just leave your dollar. All right? If not, please don't feel guilty that you don't need this dollar. Because okay. here's the challenge. Nothing changes in your brain unless I have your attention, unless I have your engagement, and unless you're using your memory, the prior knowledge you bring in here, your graduate work you bring in here. So that's why I give you dollars. A dollar enough to keep us off that cell phone. I don't know. We'll find out. So there's the challenge. Good luck on the challenge. We'll see how you do in about 35, 40 minutes. Um, let me just tell you quickly about our school. Our school is located just outside Washington, D.C., St. Andrews Episcopal School. St. Andrews was clearly a really good saint. There's about 40 of them in this country. Um, and here's our strategic vision. vision. And, and as I was thinking about it, the lines, I just was looking at your own strategic plan that came out recently. And there's a lot of similarities. We want to be the destination school for research informed teaching, learning, and leadership development. Uh, or a, day, or, or a day school, just about 600 students, so about half your size. We do chapel every Wednesday, so there's a lot of similarities, and that's why it's been great to be playing in this space with you guys. Um, the way we got to this work is we asked ourselves three disruptive questions. And here was the first one. We asked, our, imagine it, we asked ourselves what void would be left in the educational community in Washington, D.C. region if our school went away. That really was disturbing for a lot of us. And we certainly knew we were the only Episcopal preschool through 12th grade school in the Washington, D.C. area. But we still, what is, what do we do better than everybody else that the education world in D.C., or now Minnesota, can't do without? So that was one. The next one we've been grappling with is, what can a human teacher do, or the bricks and mortar do of a school? that technology can. We're all trying to figure out technology. I sometimes, in our book, NeuroTeach, we call technology the second brain of kids. Right? It's doing a lot of good in many ways. We know as educators, it's not. Right? It's a, it's, it's a very challenging tool. And we're all still trying to figure it out. But the big question, and I think you've asked yourselves this big question because of this journey you're on, is what is the next frontier is to create great teachers? And we talked a lot about a lot of different things. But we came to this really evolving space, this space called mind-brain education science, this transdisciplinary field of, of behavioral psychology, educational theory, and cognitive science. And we asked, we said, do we know more about the learning brain now than we did even 10 years ago? The answer is yes. We know a tremendous amount about the learning brain. But the problem is this, few schools are using that research to enhance the quality of their teaching, to broaden the instruction of their faculty. And that is, my, in my mind, one of the greatest ironies in education. You would not go to a doctor, right? So I, I say this story, I, actually I'm trying to tweak it a little, because uh, Daisy and I have been speaking about it, right? But if, you, if you've read the book, I tell this, used to tell this little anecdote, right? If you needed heart surgery, and you went to a heart surgeon, and he said he never did the surgery, what's your next decision? You're out of there, right? Go and find a new doctor. All right, one of the greatest ironies in education from our research is most teachers have never had any experience studying the learning brain. It might be a shock to you. That is actually true, and I'm going to show you some data coming up. What do you think as parents you might have this at your house last night. <coughs> what do you think as parents when you see this? Not a rhetorical question, need an answer. Put your phone down. Put your, put your phone down. That might be some of the problem. Right? Phone, what's next? But put your phone down, yeah. Only one source of stimulus. Yeah, one source of stimulus. So pick the book, pick the laptop, pick the phone, right? Pick one though, right? Excellent. What else? The environment she's in, as far as sitting and laying on the sofa. Right. You're questioning. Is that really suitable? You know, like you, I, I have a very formal place at home in, in Jersey to study. 
right? I, I, I sat up tall, right? I wasn't lounging. My mom didn't believe I could lounge, right? Lounge is not good, good, good study, all right? Who has seen this in, in their children, if they're old enough to be in this space, right? You, and if you haven't, I'm sorry to tell you, you will see this picture in your house. And the question is, what do you do as a parent? What do you do as a parent? What can you tell them? Because students do not believe they can't multitask. Yeah? My children just tell me to stop quoting the studies. <laughs> right, absolutely. And look, we, we cannot convince our students of this. We show them the research. Right? So what we did was, we've been talking about uh, Southwest Airlines. Uh, we have a speaker coming into our school. We have actually just arranged it this afternoon, I found out. Uh, Southwest Airlines is very famous, and thankfully the airline industry is very famous for this, of training their pilot, pilots in monocasking. Right? Which is good. I don't think you want your pilot to be texting and flying. Right? In the old days when you were driving, right? When you were driving, and you were lost, and you didn't have Siri, but you're blasting Springsteen on the radio, and you're still lost, what's the first thing you do to get your bearings? Turn, Turn off the radio, right? So the question is, how do we convince our students, using research, that this is very inefficient learning? Not only this, it takes that young woman much longer to do the assignment because of the task switching that goes on. That's our challenge. Um, and here's a great quote. I love, I've always loved this quote, right? Teaching without awareness of how the brain learns is like designing a glove with no sense of what a hand looks like. How do teachers design a class without knowing about the brain? And here's the number. So we have been in front of 9,000 teachers, just about. And we survey just about every group. We do these snapshot surveys. And what we are finding is roughly around 30% have training in the learning brain. And what, what we mean by training is roughly about 40 hours of work. That can be reading, formal workshops. That's our threshold. 30%. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind, we're, gonna, we're actually going to do a survey of the Breck faculty later this spring as we get ready to partner on, on another initiative around like an academy we're launching. There's no doubt about it that this number will hold up. It holds up everywhere, independent, private, I mean, independent schools, public and public charter, 30%. That's really unacceptable, right? So what we did at our school um, is we built a center, an anchor, to do this work. And when I heard about the Peter Clark Center, I mean, again, very similar, right? We needed an anchor. We needed leadership that would drive this curriculum initiative, this teaching initiative in our school. So if you come to campus, if you're ever in the DC area, I, I welcome you to come visit us. You walk into a building, uh, and the first thing you see is this research space, right? I, I, actually, I'm looking at a couple of things in uh, uh, Daisy Center that we want to put in there. I love the uh, container, the container store uh, stores, uh, very much so, right? This is what we have, and it's so critical to move the needle. Teachers come there. Every kind of student comes in there. Parents come in there, and I sense that's what your center's become in a couple days that I've been around here. And here's been our journey. And again, I, this is a 10-year journey. And I hope we provide some good modeling for it. But what I want to highlight is what we started 10 years ago. 10 years ago, 2007, we began training our faculty in the same way we've been training the Breck faculty the last two days, in what is called all kinds of minds. And what it does, it provides a common language and framework. And here's what's really cool. In one year from now, right, 100% of the faculty and 100% of the administration at Breck will have experienced this training. And we know that's what changes all school practice for every single kid. Not just your English teacher, not just your English department, not just your middle school, your lower school. The whole school. And Breck will be one of, I think there's only, I know six other schools that have done this in the country. They've trained 100% of their faculty in this work. Exciting. And then, this has been our journey, and obviously we have partnerships and all that, but you see the publication which you all got, the, the Orange public Publication, and that was our effort for our teachers to tell two paid stories uh, about how research has informed their practice. And I just want you to know, and you can hold Daisy accountable, she might yell at me for this one, that I challenge Brett to create their own thing differently and deeply. I think as parents, as a school, within five years you deserve 
to be able to read, and teachers deserve to write about how they've used research to transform their practice. That will scale up not only your position in, in the Minnesota market, but also nationally, which I, there's the challenge for you. Now, part, sorry about the, this, and this is a little too heavy, but I know there's people in the audience who really are interested in this stuff. What has it done for our school and our teachers and our students? So a lot more than you need, but I'd just like to point out some numbers to you that I can't not by being here. We were at 433 students in 2007. We are just going to hit 600 students next year. People come to our school because they want to be in a place where every teacher is thinking about the learning brain for every kid. That's pretty cool. Uh, faculty trained, we had zero. 100% of our faculty is trained in education and neuroscience. We have four university research partnerships. We have students who are research fellows. We are always the top three ranked of why prospective parents look at our school. 95% of the faculty who showed up last year in our hiring process mentioned the center as a reason to come to the school to be a research reform school. We have, we have received over $4 million in funding from external sources not connected to the school. So I want to just say this can do, this, what the Peter Clark can do it for, for, uh, for your school could look a lot like this. But more importantly, the most important thing is that it serves every student better. So I think th this is very blank for obvious reasons. Where, what's your journey going to look like? I'm excited to see where you guys are in 10 years. I hope as much as possible we can be part of it. And here's why I'm really excited. So this is from this afternoon, all right? And <clears throat> what's interesting about this, there's one thing that's really interesting about this picture, is this is at the end of the second day of two eight-hour sessions. So we're 16 hours into this work, and we've got about another six and seven when we go tomorrow. These people are smiling. <laughs> what the heck is that? If you know anything about professional development and education, we are often not smiling during it. So this, to me, suggests, you know what? These are teachers from every division at the school. Every division head has been involved in this. It's an amazing all-school commitment over the last two days that will continue tomorrow. This says to me, you guys are on a great track. Not the right track. You are on the great track. Explain and one's on the computer. What? Explain why there's a Katie. computer there. Uh, well, you explain. So Katie, she was sick. So she did a Google Hangout all day and we carried her around. <laughs> yeah, she participated. She, participated she was that. so into the <laughs> training that she participated from her sick bed yep. <laughs> with her cat. <laughs> there was a cat involved? Yeah, oh, and all day. All right. Right. So what's our secret recipe? We're going to get you guys working in a second. Well, one is, you've got to do this for the students. While our target audience has been teachers, the, the chief beneficiaries have to be your kids. And this is a great picture, because this represents a breadth of learners at our school. This represents some of our highest achievers. Right? Two people in this picture are going to be in Stanford next year. Awesome. Right? This represents students who struggle in their journey a little. And that's fun. That is absolutely fun. And there's, in this group, there's also those students who are those just fine kids. Those kids who somewhat don't get enough attention in our schools. Right? And I would argue, by training the Brett faculty and giving them this lens into educational neuroscience, they're going to think about all kids differently, not just the struggling learner. Uh, so what's our sort of secret sauce? What's in our, what's in our, um, our recipe? Uh, one is, how do you move a school from 30% to 100%? But here's our hypothesis. This is it. Until every teacher, all teachers, and school leaders develop knowledge, skills, and mindsets in educational neuroscience, each of their students will not meet their full potential. You guys should be psyched about what's happening with your, the faculty here. And here's the data. We believe on any measure an expert teacher has to know about the learning brain. And look, this is pretty compelling stuff. And it's, this holds up for the youngest teacher of young kids and old kids. Just be aware of this, right? The expert teacher, the teacher has this lens, gets this much deeper in terms of learning. Because we know they differentiate instruction more, they believe in each student more, and we are also seeing good information around the correlation between the more <coughs> teachers know about learning science, the higher the students will achieve academically. 
Yeah, and we look, in the end, we, we want that, right? We want our kids to be academically successful. Uh, so here are a couple things. Uh, teachers are brain changers. By the time they get to high school, we spend more time with your kids, waking time, right? Than you guys do. Right? A, a parent said that to me the other day, and I was like, that is, that's amazing, right? It's also a little depressing because I have a ninth grade daughter, right? And it's actually true, right? When do I see her? I see her in a small window every day. So I have to have a lot of trust in what she's going, the school she's going to each day. But here's the good news. Regardless of our age, our brains can change. That's really good news, right? So even though I'm 48 years old, uh, it might take me a long time to learn guitar side by side with my son right now. I'm trying it. You can imagine. So he is seventh grade. I'm not, right? He took up guitar about a year ago. I said, I'm going to try to do it with him. The difference is amazing, right? You can imagine where I'm at in my playing, not very good. Where he is, he actually is performing a little with our, our concert band. Excellent. Good job. Um, he's losing patience with me. What do you see, think, and wonder when you look at this, though? This is a, a under a microscope a synaptic density, the synapses of the brain. Any thoughts as you look at this? This is from at birth, six years, so that lower school, early, that elementary years, and then almost in high school. What do you see, think, or wonder? Yeah. Well, I just think about language development. <coughs> language like, development. Um, and if you don't catch it in time, the 14-year-old, the reason you're not seeing as much matter as you are in a six-year-old is because they've lost those abilities. They didn't get those connections. Yeah, we know. You know, I, I just so you know, yesterday I, I thanked the lower school teachers, right? Because there are certainly sensitive periods of brain development, and we know in language acquisition, those early years are critical. Now, the good news is it's certainly our brains not are fixed. We can certainly develop, but it's that much harder, right? That much harder. What else do you see? Because you probably haven't seen something like this since your ninth grade biology class, even if you've seen it then, or maybe your graduate work or undergraduate work. That was undergraduate. Yeah. Um, I'm also a pediatrician. No, the, 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 it starts with, with few synapses because there are fewer experiences. Yes. And the experiences increase, the synapses increase, and then they, um, Oh, what's the word? Brain Shed. pruning. 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 Yep. Yeah, right. So what happens? Right. So you're born, right, and you, you, your experiences create these new neural pathways and the synaptic connections, right? And then there's this brain pruning. Pruning, right? If you don't use it, you lose it, right? That's amazing. With not with language, that's by nine months. Yes. Very quick. Very quick. So again, we want teachers to know this, and most teachers look at this like they've never seen this before, because how could this information? inform curriculum, inform instructional decision. How, and the key for us is how do we find that zone of proximal discomfort? Daisy and I were talking about this as we were driving over. The job of schools is to make students feel safe, right? You, you mentioned that earlier. And, and validate their identity, right? And support them. But the job of schools is also to make students a little intellectually uncomfortable, right? And experiential uncomfortable. Because if we don't do that, we know the brain doesn't advance and grow as well. We grow when we're challenged, right? We improve when we're challenged. So what is that zone of, of proximal discomfort? Schools should make students safe, but a little uncomfortable and challenge. I think that's really critical. Um, so we're really good about this. We don't want Breck or any school, as they talk and think about the brain, to lower their standards at all, right? To lower the ball. We don't want that. There are barriers to learning that are sometimes individual, that are individualized and personalized that we should be able to address. And I love the phrase by a guy named Whit, where Rick Wormelli, who talks about fair is not always equal. I can demonstrate my knowledge in a way that reflects my strength. And another student can demonstrate it, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. And parents, you should actually appreciate that. This is not that we shouldn't give students a chance to stretch and, 
and fail sometimes and be less successful sometimes. But fair is not always equal. Um, anybody know what this is? Cockpit. Yeah. Oh, anybody know? I didn't know this until I actually just looked at the TED Talk. What, what, what airplane? Does anybody know anything about military airplanes? So yeah, the F-15, all right? It's a very famous story about this. Uh, Todd Rose is one of my favorite researchers out there right now. He has written a book called The End of Average. Uh, it's a fascinating book, uh, really easy to read. And he's, and, and he's, you know, the simple way to do it, if you're not in the mood to read or you can't, don't have time to read, his TED Talk is fantastic. Uh, but uh, he tells this story of the F-15. When the F-15 was originally made, the cockpit seat was created for the average man, the average pilot. And what they did is they collected data on thousands of pilots, and then they created the cockpit seat for the average. And what was interesting about it was the quality of flights and the success of the pilots actually went down. And they realized something. When they put together all the data, they realized of all those pilots, none of them fit the average. There was no average. So what did they do? They actually, what do you think they did to the cockpit? Well, see, you guys probably know this. Think about your own car. It's adjustable, right? It, it can be widened. It can be moved. And then they saw, not surprisingly, because they were thinking about the edges, right? They saw, saw much more success. Let me show you uh, something here. So we did a little thing with our students. We gave them a, you can't really see it, but that's really not important. We gave some terms to think about themselves as learners. And we wanted to see if there was an average. All right, so we, we did this, we walked around school, we collected this data, and here's the results we got. So how this impacts our thinking is that Schools and teachers can't think to the average, to the middle of their class, if they think that. They have to think to the edges, or they have to think about every kid. This is really important information as we try to make sure every kid is both challenged and supported. Um, I want to try to prove to you guys that we all learn differently right now. I'm going to try two quick things. All right? So here's the first one. Play along, please. I need you, so you have to use your voice. I did this with our group earlier. Say the color that is used to spell each word. Let's start up top. First one. Yeah. Yeah. Second. Blue. Blue. Next. Black. Black. Yep. Orange. Orange. Next. Red. 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 Now some of you probably did not say the color. You said the word, right? I heard at least one. All right? Because sometimes our visual cortex sees a little differently and needs a little more thinking and processing time. Here's my other favorite. Some of you probably have probably seen this. It's a little video. Let's see if I get this thing works. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Yep. Does everybody know the assignment? Mm -hmm. Players wearing white passing the basketball. Thank you. How many passes did you count? <laughs> How many? Zero. Zero? Zero? It, it didn't move. Really <laughs> 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 oh, mine's moving. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was a oh, That's why I spoke in the middle. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what did you say? I was like, God, this went so well. They're so quiet. <laughs> 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 so I don't know. Okay, I think I know. I think I can solve this problem. Let's see. By the way, yeah, there we go. Todd's TED Talk is linked on our website, on the PCCTL website, as is the 
the, um, his book, which we recommended all year. It's a great read. All right, play along again. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Skills. We've got to teach health and life skills. Yeah, excellent. I agree on that. But the question is, 
Does every kid have to learn the same exact way? And here's what research says. The answer is no. All right? And that's really critically important. And what Breck's going to be able to do, what Breck's going to be able to do, is to think more broadly about their instruction as they get more deeply into the research, which is really, really exciting for me. So uh, next time you're at Starbucks, I bet you think differently. The, the, the words I often think about when I think of Starbucks, there's some great work around uh, multicultural education work around inclusive pedagogy, equity pedagogy that fit into here. Here I do one other thing with you. Here's one other thing that I think uh, Breck really knows well. Um, when I first started teaching 25 years ago, I believe I taught, they learned. Right? I did my job, I taught really well, and they learned the responsibility for learning. And to tell me, if you told me that emotions matter in learning, I would have said, no way. Let me prove it to you. Uh, there's a concept in educational neuroscience called downshifting uh, by Merrill Hardiman and Johns Hopkins. And the idea is that Sometimes what teachers do, coaches do, parents do, paralyzes learning, paralyzes confidence of kids. And I bet you in this audience, almost every one of us has had a downshifting moment in our lives. So I'm going to tell you mine, and some of you are going to tell me yours. All right, be brave. So fifth grade, Mrs. Dubrow, English Language Arts, uh, was Mount Pleasant Junior High School, Livingston, New Jersey. If you want any more information, I can tell you. Right? Mrs. Newbrow every Friday would give a grammar quiz. Right? And as I often joke, I was not particularly strong with the comma and the semicolon. And I'm probably still not particularly strong with the comma and the semicolon. We had a great editor for our book. Right? On Mondays, she would give back the results. First thing <coughs> Monday. Right? And she would do it in grade order. Right? So imagine that. Not too strong in the comma and the semicolon. And she does that. And the reality is, I would sit there and just beg to be in the top half once in a while. Maybe in the top, and I never was. The whole year. And I really argued to believe this, that it paralyzed me as a learner. It made me feel, I was fearful to write. And as I said to the Breck teachers, I didn't learn how to write until graduate school. Now granted, I've written two books, that's really cool. Right, with one with a co-author. But I really feel I was down shooting. So my question for you is, we know emotions impact learning. Does anybody have their own downshifting moment that they're willing to share? It's, there's got to be at least one in this audience. Anytime a teacher, a coach, a parent might have paralyzed you as a learner? No? Anyone? Ray? Bueller? Anyone? Well, I think I downshift my daughter sometimes. <coughs> With, I'm sorry, it's not. Quite no, material. but it's honest. Thank you. It's great. Today we were. I picked her up from school and I asked her a question, and I said, um, "Oh well, you know, you probably need to do X, Y, Z." And she said, "Okay." And I said, "Because," and she said, "I said okay." <laughs> and I, I know I, her response to it was because. I go on and on about things sometimes, and I think it I think it pulls her focus away from the actual subject and moves her into this downshifted state where she's like, oh my god, I can't even think anymore. Right, right. We certainly know it. And, and to be honest, high school parents, we are, we do it. I do it. I'm a ninth grade parent, and we're already I, I, I catch myself those moments because they're on that, that college train, right, that treadmill. And, and if, you can, if you can at least be aware of it, after tonight, that I've done part, partly I've done my job, right? But we do downshift our kids. Uh, we don't. We want to motivate them. We want them to excel. We want to be happy. I agree. What about uh, another example? Yeah. Thank you. I, I went to military schools until I was uh, uh, 13 years old. Okay. And I just I remember being placed in groups, and you always wanted to be in the higher group. They split up the class, and it was reading. And I remembered I always wanted to be a bluebird in the bluebird group because they got to read the cool stuff. Yeah. And then you had the, you know, the orange tiger, and then you were the green frog, you know. <laughs> and the green frogs were all the kids that were having difficulties. Sure. Yeah. And by that placement, and then where you were put into the room, it, it was just all you were 
the dunk there. Yep. Yep. And kids feel that. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Alison. Really, really appreciate it. Others? Yeah, thank you. Um, in fourth grade, every Friday we had a spelling test, or a spelling, what do you familiar. call it? You have to go up in front of the spelling bee. had to go in front of the class and have to spell. And I was a terrible speller. And I would just, I'd go up and stand there. And I just, I would wait for him to just say, go ahead, move off. Because I just didn't want to speak in front of people. Right. You know, even if I knew how to spell it, I would just stand there, you know. Right. And then wait to be dismissed. But what if that teacher did one thing different? Let you sit in your seat and write it down on paper. Yeah. Like, right? Yeah. Would you, would you, A, could you demonstrate the knowledge? And is that unfair? Right. Yeah. And maybe at some point by doing that, you get the confidence to stand up and, right? So it's that scaffolding, <coughs> right? Now, it's hard for our teachers, any teacher, to create 16 different lessons for 16 different kids. But to recognize the importance of doing that and the value of doing is critically uh, important. Uh, we're going to have a, a fun, playful moment and see if you guys go along with this, we'll, right? But we talk a lot to our students and teachers about loving their limbic system, loving their amygdala, right? Parents, you, sh I, you do, but you probably don't say it like this, you should love your kid's amygdala, right? This is the emotional traffic cop of your brain. This is that switching station, and where the brain says, if I'm happy, safe, secure, I can be challenged, I can be under stress, good stress, I'm going to be able to work in the higher order thinking parts of my brain. But most of our kids, when they're sleep deprived, socially stressed, right? When they, their fear, their identity is not validated, they're working in the reactive part of their brain. So here's what I want you to do. Play along with me. Turn to a neighbor who's near you, right? Shake hands, high five. If you're married, hug it out, I guess. Uh, and tell each other, I love your baby. So come on, turn, turn. I love your big one. Come on, play it all. Play it all. We're going to be in a big one. Oh, did you lose? Thank you. So I know that felt a little uncomfortable, but isn't that my job to make you a little uncomfortable? That's what I did. Now, it would be cool if your spouse or partner or whatever's not here, and you walk in the door tonight, and you go in and hug and say, I love your amygdala, I would love to see that reaction. That would be cool. Now, we know something else that's really detrimental and paralyzing for learners and teachers as they think about learners, and that's labels. All right? And we know there are many different ways we describe students who are successful, unsuccessful, and anything. And I just, this is one of those other things that I want you guys to be aware of as parents. We've been, and we're actually training the Breck faculty right now, who we're working with, around this issue. But we've seen all these labels before, all right? High achiever, <coughs> smart, genius. And what that does, and we know from research from Carol Dweck and Angela Duckworth and others, it creates this one fixed mindset that they're not willing to take risks. And especially gets worse in high school. It's amazing. Who has a, a middle school student, eighth grade student right now? Great. What we are seeing at our school is the freedom of middle school and lower school, the play, the willing to take risks, the will willingness to fail. When you cross that bridge into ninth grade, for parents and students, everything changes. You're unwilling to do that because of the college transcript. And that, in some ways, makes me very sad. Because you're not taking advantage of the four years of Breck or wherever you are, and the rich experience to stretch yourselves. So just a lot of tonight is about making you aware and mindful. But if you're switching over from eighth to ninth grade next year, think about that. Where is your mindset today? Are you already on that? They gotta take algebra, they gotta take geometry in eighth grade, right? So they can take multivariable calculus in 12th grade, because that's going to get them into better school. Just be aware of that. And watch the labels that you use about your student, your, your child. And if you hear them from teachers, ask them what that looks like. So if the teacher says they're, they're lazy, what's lazy look like in your class? That's really an important uh, question parents should be asking. Um, our students are working hard. 
If they're anything like uh, Brex students or anything like uh, St. Andrews students, you know, some days it feels like you know, Sisyphus, you're pushing the, this, in this case, the brain up the hill. Homework is demanding, right? Extracurricular activities, sports, arts, theaters, you know, and we know this. How many hours of sleep are your kids getting? They're not, most likely, they're not getting enough, especially in high school. And we know the connection between sleep and cognition. We, it, it's some of the most compelling research out there. Now, I think Brex is a good place. You guys start school at 8.30, right? Okay. Well, that's better than the public school in my, my hometown starts at 7.15. All right? How can that happen when the research suggests otherwise? I also like that I've had some great talks with AJ, and you guys are continually thinking about the, the daily schedule of this school and the cognitive load of, your, of their students. You're, you're, you're using things instinctively to try to support students and to reduce the stress level. I, I think it's awesome. I'm really excited about it. So, we have to play with some research. So I'm gonna, you're going to have to get up now. You're actually, you're, everybody's going to come down here. Okay. And, he, and here's, we're going to do a fun activity. There are, there are some smiley faces. Don't get up yet until I explain my exercise. All right? But I want you guys to get thinking about research as parents. So there are three smiley faces and a deck of cards. And you're going to spread yourselves out. Get in groups of like seven or eight. You know, make a new friend. If you don't know somebody, you know, love their amygdala and then get started. <laughs> all right? And you're going to sort the cards. All right? Now you can cheat. But I don't want you to cheat. Because one side actually has the answers. Don't do that yet. All right? But you're going to look. There's about 22 cards here. If you need some explanation of what maybe something says, if they feel too teacher-esque, I would love to help you. But I'm treating you guys as the ultimate teacher of your children. That's what I mean. You are the ultimate teacher of your children. So here's a challenge. If you look at a card statement and you believe research suggests that teachers in school should do this, it's good for your child, put it in a happy face. If you look at the card and it's, you think it suggests that, Teachers and schools should not be doing it. Research says avoid it. Put it in a sad face. And then there are those ones that you're just not sure. Or you don't think there's research out there about them. Put it in sort of that neutral face. So does everybody understand the challenge? I hope everybody's willing to play along. Now, I do want to tell you, this is the moment when a lot of people lose their dollar bill. As you transition down, and you might have to lose your dollar bill, check on the babysitter or whatnot like that, but this is when I start collecting my money back. All right? So, we're going to let you spread out. Can you guys form groups? It's just, this is about a 10-minute activity, but if I'm a good brain-informed teacher, you better be doing something and getting up. So, grab your stuff, grab your little packet, and let's play. You can spread out on the stage, you can use the steps, make some new friends, maybe introduce your, your son or daughter's name, what grade they're in. Right? Well, we have four stacks. One, one's to my right, stage right. Make sure you introduce yourself if you don't know each other. Make your money back. Things that might have been false, 
But in general, the research slants one way or the other. Were any really puzzling, or you're like, wow, I'm surprised about that. This is my punt, right, for Bernie? Any, anyone's really, that was interesting. Or, or that's, play along. That's not the learning style. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about the typing versus handwriting. Because we thought handwriting was more effective, but if some kids have dysgraphia or something that makes it challenging for them, that they may need other devices. Yeah, it was, it was great to hear. I asked the faculty the other day, the number of schools I presented recently have given up teaching handwriting in the younger grades. Right? No, I, learned, I did cursive in the younger grades, and, and a lot of schools have just, the, the iPad, the keyboard is there. Uh, and the reality is the research still is in favor of if you have the neuromotor ability, then taking notes by hand helps memory consolidation still better than keyboarding because your brain's working harder. Right? Your brain is thinking, is this important or not? Now, this is not easy for all kids. You know, I have a number of my kids I, who now just record my voice, and in Google, they can do that, and then it types those notes for them. Now, to be honest though, they've been performing worse on assessments than my students taking notes by hand. So, that, well, if you don't have the ability to take notes, and you don't have to find and grab for motor skills, certainly we want them to be keyboard. Yes, Daisy. Can I just add to that? I love you. So you are absolutely right that um, the brain working to decide what's salient and what to put down when you're at the note-taking phase, much better to handwrite. And the research that you do remember more, and you, you just actually, that kind of gets in there. It sticks more. Um, when doing output for writing, let's say in story or writing something, that's when keyboarding is found to be a bit more effective. But there's another layer to this. I just shared some research with Ty um, Thayer, and he's sharing it out with some of the lower elementary faculty about even before you're ever creating notes, just the activity of handwriting, even as opposed to tracing letters, like the what we like freeform handwriting, there is some really compelling research of the neural development that that creates, the pathways that creates. It's building the brain in ways that we don't know yet, but building the brain in important ways that don't happen if we don't do it. So it's not that it necessarily relates to later handwriting or later note taking, but that it's actually just exercising our brain and stretching our brain and pushing our brains in ways that are very important. So just so you know, we're on top of this and we're sharing it out and that's part of, that's a good example of this work. And, and, and that's just the exact reason why you need, you're sick. In many ways, you're ahead of us where we were 10 years ago because you have a center. You have faculty at the center. I mean, Daisy we, we, is in Harvard Graduate School of, of Education, trained in MBE. Sarah, I think, has been at every learning the brain conference I've been doing the last, who knows when, right? We, 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 we sort of stalk each other. Um, I'm aware that uh, Alexis Kent is in, has done a lot of work in this MBE world. You have an anchor that we actually didn't have, to, have 10 years ago. So a little jealous, we caught up. So, uh, and also, you've gotten grant, you get, you get grants like EE Ford to do this work, right? We just got our first EE Ford grant about two years ago. You are getting, you, and you have generous donors like we do, generous parents who choose Brent, who want to support Brent and this Peter Clark Center in these ways. Ah, uh, give me one more. So I want to talk about the learning style one because I have to bash this out of your brains. I just have to. I, I, because you got, I, you're too good. You're, you're at a school that's too good. So intuitively, we believe as parents that if my teacher, my, so first of all, if a student says I'm a visual learner, that creates a very fixed mindset. All right? Number two, the theory that, that I teach little Glenn visually and assess him visually, he will do better has never been proven. So if you ever see the words, or somebody talk about learning styles, and that we should teach to your individual learning styles, there's no research behind that. But this is what there's research behind. And this is what Brecht does very well, clearly. Multiple modality instruction. That they would use sense, multiple sensory instruction, which I see much better in lower school teachers and upper school teachers or middle school teachers multiple modalities, they will teach to using visual and auditory, all right? 
and all the other kinesthetic, you name it. That's what you hope your students are getting. And I'm clearly in our discussion with your faculty in the last two days that you are. But please, 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 if you ever do this true-false exercise again, don't get the learning style one wrong. I, I beg you. you. You guys are too good. You've been too informed uh, by myself. And probably, who's been any other speakers you've had this year? Oh, Peter Brown. Peter Brown. But I'm sure they, they've acknowledged it. Some of them acknowledge this in some ways. How many groups got that one wrong? Just out of curiosity. The learning style. Right? We, we all think it's true, right? We all think I'm a right brainer, right? And you ran us through that already once. Pardon me? Daisy. Oh, yeah. oh. Yes, sir. Yeah. So are you suggesting it's not important for teachers to recognize students' learning style? There aren't no, so there, there are no, so the learning style theory doesn't exist. Now, what does exist is certainly we all have learning preferences. And we all have current learning strengths and weaknesses. Every student has learning strengths. Every student. Every student has a learning weakness. If, if, if you think that's not true of your kid, you're absolutely wrong. Or the school's not challenging him or her enough. Right? So that we agree on. And that's developmental. A strength of mine in, in third grade might not be my same strengths, but we don't want teachers to teach the individual learning styles because we're not going to be supporting research that the brain changes in neuroplasticity. So it's a nuance, right? We have learning preferences. I bet you guys will learn. You know, if I told you to go learn about the Civil War tonight, some of you would do what? Maybe you go read. Some of you would do a documentary, right? Uh, 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 book, not book, uh, Ken Burns Civil War series. Some of you might do a book on tape because you actually don't want to read. But okay. Some of you might look at Civil War maps, right? And look at spatially the war, right? That's a great way. But the, I, you learn the Civil War better if you do all four, though, right? If you read, go to the, the Ken Burns documentary, look at the geography of the war, and if you listen to Audible, I'm a huge Audible fan. All right, let's bring tonight to a close. So I'm assuming this is our friend again, right? All right, stay standing. Come on, stay standing. Let me go back and get your dog. I get it there. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I would like to think we're better able to support the student. Now, you're not going to convince your son or daughter tonight to not multitask, all right? But I think the Peter Clark Center could help that either, right? We just got to keep hounding kids that they are task switching is a transaction cost. If you're doing your English essay and the President of the United States clearly is texting you, you've got to answer. You have to answer that, right? It's got to be that or the Pope or somebody who's calling you up. And you go over to the cell phone. You don't go back to the same place where you were doing your work. Kids don't believe this. That's the research study we should be doing. Uh, so, how do we ensure that your kids, remember the first question, are both happy and challenged? Well, it still comes down to great teachers. The human element of schools. And when, as, as, this, as this trajectory breaks on, and that I feel very privileged to be supported, is the right trajectory. You now, at the F by tomorrow around 3 o'clock, every division head in this school will have been trained in an oral developmental framework for learning. That is cool. All right? And teachers from every division, not every teacher, and then a year from now, I'm coming back. I can't believe, well, I think I'm still invited back. Oh, right? Yeah. I know, I know. I'm coming back with a team, and we're going to train everybody else, which is so cool. And a year from now, you'll be one of the few schools in the country who can be seen as a national leader in this, but more, forget that. They're serving your kids better. So, um, how do you do? If you earn the dollar, keep the dollar. It's a reminder. Don't feel guilty, I'm taking money from a teacher who probably doesn't make that much money. Uh, I'll just say this, I just say this, I followed my Jewish, Jewish grandmother's advice. Uh, I did not marry another teacher. Uh, so I did okay. So okay, if you learn it, but it's a reminder to you as adults, don't multitask. Model monotasking here, and hopefully, by this dollar activity, you learned a little more tonight, at minimum, you better not get the learning style question ever again. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm a big Twitter guy. If you don't, if you like Twitter, um, you can certainly follow me on Twitter. I don't text or tweet about my family or anything like that. I just tweet about research. But I really, uh, I'll pass it back to Daisy and Sarah. I thank you for the commitment you made on a Friday night. But just know the teachers are going to do one better tomorrow. And on Saturday morning, they're here. Snaps for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. recognize that having our speaker series this year, and there is one more speaker this year that is uh, from Chris Ohm, who has set this up for the parents coming up in May. This is um, Harlan Cohen coming to talk about the naked roommate. You're at college, got a naked roommate, what do you do? So that's our last <laughs> in the speaker series. The speaker series, though, it, it's very important we know the speaker series is made possible, including Glenn being here tonight and all of our wonderful speakers this year because of a generous donation in honor of the class of 2016. Uh, we want to keep it going. We would like to have a speaker series next year as well. One of the speakers we'd like to have next year again would be Glenn Whitman, speaking to not 34 people, but 234, 300. But we'd love to fill this place. So not only as Glenn holds us to getting ourselves a publication going, like the one in your hands, but we also want to hold him to doing a night with a full house here, and then we want to hold you to spreading the word when that goes out, telling your friends, saying, hey, you know what, I was at his talk last year, it was amazing, it was great, it was wonderful, please go. Because word of mouth matters <laughs> so much. So that's challenges for all of us. And again, thank you, Glenn, so no, much. What else? We'll look forward, we'll look forward to He's not going to be here on Friday. No, not on Friday. Really no, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, we actually are looking forward to tomorrow. Every faculty member there has just been incredibly uh, excited, engaged. They are thrilled to come back tomorrow. And that is a credit to Glenn and Sushila Robinson, who's also here training with him. So please know how excited the faculty fellows are to be doing this work. Thank you so much. Good night. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you.